Thank you again, Brian, for agreeing to take time out of your busy schedule twice uh, to do this interview. And maybe we can begin with the reason you decided to accept our invitation to write the chapter and what you see as its significance to the contribution to the book. Sure. Well, um, I mean, I, I know both you and Corey, and I know the the level and the caliber of your work. And so to receive an invitation like that, is, it's automatically attractive. Um, but I'm also really committed to the idea of social justice as well as, you know, um, environmental and, and economic justice and the, the whole gamut of things to improve the ways um, in which we live in this world um, and with this world. So that too is an attraction. And whenever there's a conversation about qualitative inquiry, I think it's also important to have the conversation about what St. Pierre would call the critique and the coming after. And mm -hmm. so to add the piece about post-qualitative inquiry, I think is also um, important to have. And I think it's important to um, make it clear that post-inquiry, oops, sorry, I think that was a calendar alert. So hopefully that won't be happening much, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they can um, edit that out in some way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it's also important to show that post-inquiry or post-qualitative inquiry or w whatever um, folks may be calling it, um, that it is not standing contrary to other traditions that have um, aims, purposes, and goals for, for advocating for justice and for change um, uh, on, on myriad levels. And I think there's some... Um, kinship between critical feminist theory um, and, and queer theory and other approaches um, to what folks are doing with um, post-qualitative inquiry. And I think it's important to show that there's connection and um, space for, for, for us all to sit at this table together, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, thank you. You mentioned social justice, could you, give an overview of how you conceptualize that for your chapter, what it means to you? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I talk about it a lot in terms of, um, in relation to sort of micro politics, um, politics of the everyday of, of looking at um, um, what's immediately in front of us and where we live right now, as opposed to maybe a capital J sort of justice that stands as kind of an abstract um, sort of standard somewhere of, of, of a justice that we all have to measure to. So um, David Roussel, and I may be pronouncing his name incorrectly, but he wrote a book where he talks about um, little justices. And so that is a really nice way to think about justice a little bit differently. Yeah. That coincides nicely with what Patty Lather described as a thousand tiny methodologies. Um, and so with post-qualitative inquiry, I think there is a lot of space and it's a, in a lot of ways, it's like a clearing out of space for um, a lot of different ways of thinking and doing both research and justice. Um, sometimes not in a grand or some sort of spectacular way, but even in the small, everyday, tiny ways, the modest, the humble ways, um, which I think are, are really important. And so in my chapter, I talk about a, a neighborhood that I lived in and things that were happening right in my immediate living space and how, um, you know, small gestures can actually open that space for a different way of living that is both more neighborly, it's more humane, um, and, you know, hopefully more just. Mm -hmm. I love that. So perhaps that's a nice segue into an overview of your chapter as a whole. Sure. Um, well, I talk a lot about my dissertation research and kind of my experience of coming to uh, learn and understand post-qualitative inquiry as a process and as uh, a process that is um, based in a very different sort of onto-epistemological sort of um, orientation or, or, or um, 
you know, a, a different onto epistemology. And I talk about um, how I, I've, I kind of came to embrace it as that onto epistemology involving eminence and to embrace this um, this way of living that is very experimental and an experimental way of doing um, research, not in the um, like controlled experiment sense, but more like, um, was it Stuart Hall who talked about experiments and living? Um, I didn't realize he had used that phrase before I wrote my dissertation. I was inspired by Deleuze and Spinoza and some others, but, um, but still doing some experiments in living and trying to figure out how to live. Um, and so I talk about kind of how I came to that and how I navigated some of that process, some of the ups, the downs, the trials and errors. And then I use that space to really um, provide some overview of um, some of the perhaps, um, um, I think, critical or, or more um, crucial sort of principles, ideas, or um, guiding sort of thinking that kind of shapes uh, post-qualitative inquiry. And, and so I, I talk about quite a lot of things, um, my process, my experience, but also, you know, some of the content of my, my dissertation research, again, about this neighborhood that I lived in and the events that were happening there and how I could um, kind of change a little bit of how I lived in relation to those and maybe open up that space for for a little bit more just way of living. Um, yeah. Awesome. So that um, that raises for me two follow up questions. One, what would you say are those core principles of post qualitative research? And two, how has your thinking along these lines evolved? Because you clearly didn't start where you are today. And it's neat to hear you talk about your dissertation. So mm -hmm. maybe you can walk us through sort of the evolution of your thought process. Sure. Um, so kind of the crucial principles, I think, um, I should read the chapter, everyone, <laughs> but you know, just Fair to <laughs> give um, some broad strokes, uh, some of the things that I, I kind of focus on is um, the difference in onto epistemology and um, how I, I, I kind of try to, um, move within some similar veins that St. Pierre does when she talks about a, a two world ontology or a world or an ontology where there are abstractions that kind of stand outside of um, experience in the experiential sort of world. Um, and I contract that with, uh, contrast that with this idea of a, in, an ontology and epistemology of eminence and how this is within, we're talking about something right here, right now. Um, and, and, so I think that is a, a big piece of the puzzle is that different onto epistemology and starting there rather than thinking of this as a different set of tools to put into my methodological toolbox to be applied with the same sort of um, same sort of approach that you might other methodologies. What I'm really trying to emphasize is we have to kind of start from a different place um, in our in our thinking around ontology and epistemology. Um, I also talk a lot about this idea of an image of thought and how there are structures around our thoughts and maybe um, uh, some systems that are kind of built into social science um, that we are trying to push against or resist or break open to think differently. Um, so I'm valorizing some of those things and encouraging um, readers as well as myself to continue that work, to open up that space, to think differently and to live differently and, and to engage the world differently. Um, another thing is it's not prescriptive. There's not a, a way to just prescribe and say, this is what you do and how you do it. And, and that's a really challenging thing. And so yeah. talk a lot about my own challenges and struggles with that. Um, but with all of that, the, the idea fundamentally is, is um, the, the stakes here are the new and what the new actually means or looks like is probably in and of itself not really fully formed in, in uh, our imagination. So part of it is striking out and kind of taking what I think maybe Spinoza would call a voyage in imminence, like, or maybe it was Deleuze who might have used that phrase, but you know, just kind of launching out and being in this thing 
rather than um, leveraging different tools on a thing, you're 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 always in it. Um, some of my my thinking has definitely shifted and evolved and changed. Um, I did my dissertation. I guess it was seven years ago now, which seems it doesn't seem like it's that long ago. But when I say mm -hmm. it out loud, it sounds forever, really long. But um, I, I I had someone ask me very recently if I would do anything differently. Um, looking back and and I said yes of course I would I mean um, um, there's lots of things I would do differently but I think I couldn't be where I am now if I hadn't gone through and done the things that I did um, so um, so I think one of the things I challenge readers in the chapter to do that I found particularly helpful and that I still try to practice is really starting with that different onto epistemology and really trying to live that out and not have it as some abstract idea, but to see how these things actually can be um, like how they're lived every day. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think Deleuze would have talked about like the we need concepts that are abstract enough to get to the very concreteness of where we live, right? And and so um, I think for me the hardest part was was moving from this place of thinking that this is all heady philosophical stuff and slowly moving to where this is all very real lived stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is the slow process that I have been in and continue to be in, where now I can, I often am just living my life and thinking in these ways because I am living in these ways and the two go very much hand in hand. Whereas oh. when I first began, uh, I think I was trying to think it and figure it out and then try to find some way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Where now oh. it's, mm -hmm. so yeah. now it's a very different way of moving in it. And I'm always learning and relearning um, things. Um, I, I had a thought not, not long ago um, I think it was one of Brian Mossimi's books. I was like, I really need to read that again because I think I might understand it now <laughs> or at least understand it a little better. Um, and, you know, I, I leaned on him very heavily in all of my 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 scholarship, you know, and um, but there, there's so many things there. A lot of a lot of these ideas that we are um, pulling on in post qualitative inquiry they're very rich and they're very nuanced and and there's not just one way to put them to work for you and i think as our lives change um so does our way of leveraging or wielding those concepts and ideas to help build our lives or rebuild them or shape them or you know use them in our communities to um, do something meaningful and important for us there too mm -hmm. so it's a very live reality and i don't know if that really answered your question but that's the answer i have yeah i think <laughs> it, it does understand sort of the evolution of your thinking of where you started and some of the challenges that you faced and how you remain sort of a lifelong learner in this endeavor. And really that's an integral part of the process is that we every day get to show up and reimagine what this world could be through mm -hmm. this view of justice. So uh, yeah, I think you answered it. Thank you. Sure. I think you touched upon this, but I'd love to hear you talk explicitly about why you think that this is such a great fit for your work. Yeah. Um... My master's thesis, I focused on phenomenology, um, and with phenomenology, I was also playing with and leveraging some post-structural thinkers, and um, I think um, uh, some post-structural sort of sensibilities and ideals. Um, and, and and that really sparked some of my interest to go further into the post-structural side of things. And what I found compelling about post-structuralism and, and post-structural thinkers is that one, they they weren't prescriptive in what they were. They never told people what to do or how to do it. Um, and and I found that 
oddly very empowering and very liberating. And then as I started to explore that further and engage with um, thinkers around post qualitative inquiry, I found that those two things had um, very much a, a they both inspired that lib that that sense of freedom and liberation and empowerment to um, do things different. Um, I, I know in my master's thesis, I often would think to myself or recite to myself even, trust your process, um, lean on the methodology like it says to do this. So just do that and see what happens. But with this, didn't have that. I couldn't lean on a methodology in that sense. I couldn't trust a process in that procedural sort of sense, yeah. uh, which meant that I had to live this thing. And it, and it was performative in a sense, like it had to be um, actually lived out. And um, so there was an experimentalism that and an empowerment that I think post qualitative inquiry offered me that maybe some other methodologies did not. And it may have been my perception. It may have been where where I sort of was at the time. But nonetheless, I felt like I could do different things and I could think differently and I could move in different ways and I can engage in different ways. And that just I found it very compelling to um, have an opportunity to try something yeah. different, even if even if it fell flat, even if it was um, a, a catastrophe. I, I remember citing Brian Mossy where he says you you have to embrace your own stupidity or, or the risk of looking stupid. And um, which I think he he kind of quips it doesn't that's not really it's not what people are going for in academia usually. But so there's, <laughs> there's risk there, but there was also something very compelling and exciting. And um so I wouldn't say this is for everyone, but for me, that that was a good fit. And for what I wanted to explore in relation to this idea of joy that I was drawing upon from Spinoza and then again with Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, I think that's how you say it in French. It might, I typically say Guattari, but I'm from the deep south in Georgia. <laughs> um, so I butcher a lot of say, uh, names and, and, and things, but um yeah, I, for me, it was very compelling um, to, to have this idea of joy and with that to say, okay, part of that means um, that we are, are, are able to augment and to expand um, and to change and shift and to move differently and in different ways and think differently, live differently. And, and the methodology seemed to really provide an avenue for that to be explored in ways that maybe others did not. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. So what type of data would you typically collect within this framework? It's a great question. And in in the chapter, I do address that a little bit. Um, I think I think there's a little bit of debate amongst different thinkers about what qualifies as data or even if we should um, retain a category of data. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of play play some of those arguments out a little bit. But, you know, for me, I think um, really everything is on the table and everything can be data. Um, and that it's really not about what is or is not more. I think it's about what does it do for us? What does a particular thing do? I think anything within a given situation, um, a given milieu, um, all those components that are interacting and moving and um, affecting and being affected um, in these various dynamics and relationships. I think all of that can can be thought of as data or even um, less ab or even outside of that sort of abstract concept can be thought in specificity in relation to what they are doing in that situation. Um, mm -hmm. And I, those details matter. I think yeah. that 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 um, however you whether you keep the word data or or not or however you conceptualize data or what what that means i think it's important to have that conversation and have that discussion for me personally i think any components in in a lived situation 
um, it's important to get to the specificity to see what they are doing and how they are interacting and um, relating to one another to shape a moment, to shape a life, to shape um, this thing around what we call inquiry. Um, and so I think that becomes an interesting place and a very fruitful place to kind of explore and play. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so two follow-up questions. One, what would be the ethical considerations that go along with that? And two, how do you then embark on a process of analysis? Okay, ethical considerations. It, we 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 all need to have a um, a bit of sobriety, right? Um, <laughs> that our different institutions, our different disciplines have all different manner of stipulations and even unspoken ideas around what counts for um, legitimate research, knowledge, um, scholarship, etc. And so there needs to be a real, I think it's ethical to have that discussion with, with people um, to help guide your research, even if even if you're a very experienced researcher, have a have someone that you trust who can be a sounding board to talk and work through some of those considerations. Um, different journals might respond very differently. So I think that's there's questions around all of that that probably need to be discussed in relation to these other disciplinary or institutional sort of parameters. Another area of ethics is. Um, I, I suppose what what you do with um, the world around you, and what are you creating from your your research, and how does that affect the the people in the world around you? And those conversations need to be to be had. Mm -hmm. um, but the, there's a third piece that I think is equally important to the first two, and that is um, how are you going to care for yourself? And you know when you remove you know, a lot of the structures around methodology um, and there's not a whole lot to lean on or fall back on, you know, that can be very distressing. It can be um, disquieting and uh, like it can it can be anxiety producing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, I, I believe they they had this wonderful piece that they, they had written somewhere in A Thousand Plateaus about leave enough space, leave enough territory intact for you to just get up in the morning, right? So we can deterritorialize too quickly. We can bring down structures and walls and make everything flat and smooth like too quickly, too much too soon. And it and it can actually be detrimental, dangerous, and it can cause harm to, to self and to others even. And so I think it's important to leave enough of whatever that space is, whatever that little plot of land is that you need to be able to get up in the morning, leave that intact. And in fact, make sure you take good care of it, you know, cultivate it. Give yourself something um, that makes it possible to get up in the morning. There were several times in my dissertation where with all the excitement of being able to just kind of go and try stuff out, um, there was a lot of times when I was quite panicked, um, you know, um, anxious and, and uh, you know, lost, um, confused, upside down, <laughs> you know, um, not knowing what to do. And I, I, I saw a therapist during my dissertation writing and, um, and, and, you know, eventually found some rhythms and patterns that helped me um, keep that piece of land for myself intact that made it easy for me to get up in the morning. And, and so I think it's important to have conversations around all of those things mm -hmm. um, and to be really honest and to enter this, you know, with a bit of sobriety as well as excitement and enthusiasm. So the ethical question, I give you three things to consider. There's probably two dozen that we <laughs> probably should be talking about, but I'll save those for another time. Okay. Yeah, I like that idea of like um, like a little patch of grass or whatever it is. And to me, that type of self care seems at the heart of this of the conceptualization of justice. Like mm. really committing to self care in that way, given our current societal trends around busyness and productivity and 
outputs, uh, it seems like a particularly relevant form of justice to me. So it's neat to hear you talk about that. How would you say the crisis of representation and or legitimation play into this uh, framework, if at all? I think that the crisis of legitimation, I think that is um, part and parcel of what I was speaking to just a second ago. Uh, yeah. with, you know, do, do people even think that this is real or legitimate at all? And I think qualitative researchers have faced that as well. And so the, I think instead of resolving that issue with this other turn, you know, I think it intensifies. Um, <laughs> I think it keeps, it's a struggle that I think everybody has to um, face and contend with. With representation, I I write a lot about um, in this chapter about this being non-representational in the sense of it is we're not trying to um, generate copies or tracings of something observable in the world um, in that in that sense that you sometimes see in social science work. Um, and we talk a lot about that, um, but I think there's also um, I'm losing my train of thought. Forgive me. That's okay. Um, what you were talking about was very interesting. But you're <laughs> talking about the, the, the crisis of representation and how it factors yeah. into your work and that you write about how it's anti-representational. Well, I th at my office phone, I thought it was ringing there for a minute. It just threw me off. Thank you. <laughs> so it's less about creating copies of what you see in observable in the world. Um, it's more about, um, it's not a tracing, it. I hope y'all can edit this bit out. A hundred percent. You want to just skip this question and move on? Let me try one last time. And I'll okay. keep it simple. I don't think I'm going to be able to articulate that piece, but I talk about it being non-representational, um, not trying to create copies or tracings of, of things in the world. Um, that would correspond to a different ontology. Yes. Um, but I, I, I also think it's important to stress that um, I think it was Dewsbury who said um, we miss a trick in in research if we think it's only about living up to reality, when in fact it's about finding ways to um, to live despite reality or something to that effect or, or finding new ways to live with reality. And, and I think that's, that's really something I think that post qualitative inquiry um, really focuses on is that instead of trying to live up to some sense of reality representationally or trying to reproduce it somehow, we're trying to create new different ways of living with reality, um, which is a, a different shift and a different um, emphasis. Um, yeah. So I'll just leave that there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Do you find, given the freedom that you found within this framework, an opportunity to write differently as an academic than you have with other methodologies? Um, yes. Um, Yes and no, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm I'm bound by the language that I know, mm -hmm. and um, and and so there there's limitations with all of all of us with that. And I mean, we we use the words that we have. We use what we have to do the work, despite its limitations. Um, and I guess that speaks back to the representational piece and le legitimacy piece. Like we're never like there there's never some adequate capture of anything and and that's just that's just the way it is right i mean but we endeavor towards getting close to something that um is important or interesting or that is impactful and that makes a difference and i think that's something with post qualitative inquiry that i find very compelling is that it's um really about producing something different um, with my writing, I guess in 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 some ways it's it has been very heady, maybe intensely, um, intensely so. 
um, very robust theoretically. And, and I think part of that is maybe my own wrestling with, with how to articulate um, things in ways that I feel satisfied with. Um, there are spaces to to write creatively and to do things creatively. And I think that can be a wonderfully um, beautiful way to approach this. Um, I often think you you almost have to have to write speculatively as well, that you're um, never really capturing anything. So you you're approaching and getting close, but not ever landing. And um, so, I think there's got to be a, a good bit of humility and modesty in our writing. Um, I think we need to be honest in our writing. And, and um, if anything, the, the writing that I am most attracted to now and that I um, am, am inspired by is writing that I find to be um, unflinchingly honest and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that I think is, um, I, 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 I can't say that I've ever really achieved that, but it's something that I value and that I'm, I want to, I want to get there um, and being vulnerable and open and honest in my writing um, at, at sort of an unflinching vulnerability. And so I think, I think there's, those are things that I endeavor to and that I, I try to do. I, I, I don't want to, to, I, it's, it's very difficult to say that I've, achieved any sort of, you know, like I got it all figured out. I don't, um, but I'm working. I, those are the things that I think are important and valuable. A lot of people might stress, like, I think creative analytic practices is, 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 is wonderful. Um, I, I don't, I didn't really take that up in, in my work um, here, although I did work with an artist who created um, um, paintings based on the things that I had written. And so I included some of that in my work. Um, so there was the whole process was a creative process, not just the the prose. Um, and and I, if I could do it over, I, I I think I would like to experiment with that more. Um, I think there are some spaces where that can really be advantageous to to approach those levels of vulnerability um, that I think are important that are sometimes really difficult to do. Um, with this type of work, especially when it's fairly new to, to you or maybe new, broadly speaking. Yeah, good points. Uh, what is one thing that you wish uh, scholars knew about post-qualitative inquiry? Um, okay, a couple things. One, people who do post-qualitative inquiry do not think that other people's work is crap. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to say it. Um, it's, it, it, that that's not the thought. I mean, I think for me, there's room for all of us at the table. What I like about post qualitative inquiry is it makes some space for other things to emerge and come to the table. Um, it doesn't devalue or uh, there's some heavy critique against um, certain ways of doing qualitative research or maybe even some heavy critiques against qualitative research if we even want to think a little bit broadly. But it's um, it's not meant to devalue or to say that it's worthless or it doesn't serve us well. I think it certainly does. And and so that's one thing. We're not anti um, anybody or anything. We're simply making space for other stuff too. Um, the other thing I, I would like for people to know is that post qualitative inquiry is not something that works very well if let's say you did like my master's thesis i'm in a I collected all this phenomenological data and then i say okay now i'm going to take that data and i'm going to do something post qualitative with it it's not a post hoc sort of you know after the fact apply this to like a lens to kind of filter through you really have to start differently with this different onto epistemology and allow that process to really form itself as you go and and wherever it takes you to just ride that voyage in imminence um the post hoc sort of after the fact thing I mean, advise against it it doesn't <laughs> work very well um see a good bit of that i would encourage not doing that um 
<laughs> but I think also, um, I, I I remember um, Betty St. Pierre, and I hope it's okay that I call her Betty instead of Elizabeth, but that's how I know her. I remember her saying um, at some point, like to make these turns your own. And so I think that there is value in just repeating that to say that this is something that scholars can make their own. This, the turn, the post qualitative turn or whatever it may be called, that it can be made one's own and um, that it is not fully coagulated or rigidly circumscribed. It's, it's open and hopefully it'll always stay open. And in that way, there can be those, um, the thousand tiny methodologies and, and a million and one ways of doing things and a billion little justices. Um, and hopefully all of that can inspire difference in creating and generating that difference in our lives and in, in the world around us and in the lives of others, so. Mm -hmm. Love that. What do you think is critical to the future of this methodology? I think just that, leave it open. Okay. I, I, there are some books coming out. This is one. Um, there, there are others. Um, but what I'm, what I hope is that it will not, it will never be. Um, the process of inquiry will never be um, shackled to a procedure of of research. If I can be so bold, I I would really hope that um, for post qualitative inquiry that it will not be. Um, gridded out and, and given procedural, you know, ABCs, one, two, threes, that it will stay open, fluid, dynamic, and diverse. Got it. And if there's one piece of advice you could give to people just starting out on this process or this journey, what would it be? The same advice that I heard my whole way through my dissertation process and that I repeat to myself and to <laughs> other you know, students and other folks that I come in contact with, read, 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 get smart. You can be as smart as you want to be um, and there's nothing holding you back. Um, it's time, it's energy, it's those sort of investments, but read. Um, and when you're reading things that are different, difficult, whatever, just stay in it. Don't um, don't pull back from it. Just stay in it. And eventually some of that stuff will start to really take traction and you'll find yourself moving along with it. Um, so read and then talk to people. Um, one of the things that I did during my dissertation is I emailed Brian Masumi because I was reading his books and I was like, I thought I kind of had an idea of what this was. Now that I'm trying to actually do something with this like I'm I think I might have missed the whole thing so I just like I'm so lost and confused I just took a shot in the dark and emailed him and said can you uh I don't know if I missed this whole thing but how does this work and he was really super generous and nice and he emailed me back and um and I I have used what he wrote in his, his email because many, many times because it really helped explain things and open up the ideas to me in ways that I didn't quite, I didn't realize before. So um, reach out to people, talk to people, have conversations, read stuff. You never know um, what can come from, a from you know, just a quick email. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do. Stay in it. That's fantastic. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate your time today. And I really appreciate you doing this interview twice. I think your book has just made such a significant or your chapter has made such a significant contribution to the book. And we're so grateful for your time on our behalf. It's my pleasure. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Take, Take care. care. Okay. Bye. Bye.